skepticism and blind faith, with comments on book burning, biological surrealism and game rules. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or likeness of anything that is in the heaven above or that is in the heaven beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. Religious fundamentalists of the extreme sort often take the above verse literally and regard all art as a sin against God. Religious liberals, on the other hand, are aware that a sentence with a colon in the middle must be read as a whole. They say, reasonably, that the above text is not forbidding the making of images and likenesses in itself. It is forbidding the act of worshipping an image or likeness. In terms of logic, the author, Moses or God as you will, does not condemn P or Q, making an image or worshipping it, but P and Q, making an image and worshipping it. That's a bit of relief to those of us who like to make images. As an artist, to the extent that a novelist may still be called an artist these days, I make images or metaphors or parables, call them what you will, but I do not bow down and worship them, nor do I expect my readers to comport themselves in that undignified manner. Nonetheless, any image or metaphor can quickly become an idol if it is not immediately identified as an artwork. Bacon and Nietzsche, amongst others, have animadverted on that subject before me. It is the thesis of this book that since the passing of the old idolatry and the old inquisition, we have seen, without recognising what was happening, the rise of a new idolatry and the new inquisition. Of course, that thesis is a polemical position, a wild satirical exaggeration, a fancy bit of rhetoric, of course. Nonetheless, in the following pages, I will examine scandals that most people would rather forget and look into yarns that the comfortable would rather ignore. You might call this an expedition into the philosophical unconscious, where materialist society buries its repressed fantasies and fears. I suspect that I shall make myself unpopular. I shall exhibit learned men behaving with the bigotry of Mississippi lynch mobs, distinguished scholars conspiring to suppress dissident opinions, savants acting like circus clowns or hooligans. I shall regale you or annoy you with creatures who pass almost as wolves but who are not wolves, signs and wonders in the sky, very few of which are conventional enough to be called flying saucers, cats with wings, a two-headed goat and a talking mongoose, flying furniture, levitating mammals, phantom trains, a lady who seems to have climbed Mount Everest in high heels, and a man who might have made a rainstorm with a non-existent energy before the defenders of reason burned his books and threw him into prison. I will resurrect buried heresies, defend the indefensible, and try to think the unthinkable. Of course, most of this is merely offered as intellectual entertainment, as philosophical comedy in the manner of the Greek sophists who would argue absurd propositions just to baffle and bewilder the orthodox. I hardly expect the ordinary common sense reader to take much of it seriously, any more than the average reader of 1905 would consider for a moment that space and time might be relative to the observer. Personally, I am not brave enough or mad enough to believe all of what follows. I utter sarcasms, I raise subversive doubts, I turn idols upside down and ask embarrassing questions about the king's new clothes, but it is all in the spirit of fun, honestly. No more malicious than Gulliver's travels, actually. But I quote the warning of the linguistic philosopher Josiah Warren, it is dangerous to understand new things too quickly. 
I might possibly be a little bit serious part of the time. The priests who serve the citadel, the scientific technological elite of our time, are paid workers on salary and most of their earnings derive from the military industrial complex that owns and governs most of the world and wishes to own and govern the rest of the world as well. One does not have to be a dogmatic Marxist to accept some of the Marxist reality tunnel and wonder if the priests of the citadel have a vested economic interest in supporting the axioms of their employers and of imperialist materialist philosophy in general. For instance, it has been hazardous to economic self-interest in some cases to wander even as far from fundamentalist materialism as to accept the heresy of dialectical materialism. To embrace a non-violent religious sect means, in many cases, that one is obliged by conscience to resign from the citadel. These are potent, if tacit, factors in determining the reality tunnel within the citadel. Most of the employees of the citadel are white and most are male. These are other potent sources of bias and one can even predict from them what sort of ideas in general are regarded as unthinkable within the citadel. To deny that these economic statistical factors influence the models and reality tunnels in the citadel is to contradict the major findings of the last hundred years of sociology, anthropology and social psychology. That the philosophy of fundamentalist materialism is the only known philosophy that justifies the behaviour of the military industrial complex is hardly a coincidence. Christianity, Buddhism, existentialism and most other philosophies regard the materialist, militarist elite as monstrous. Back on page 7, I asked you to play the Aristotelian logic game and classify some propositions as true or false. The first of these propositions was water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. Within the Aristotelian game, with only two choices, it is probable that most of us would classify this proposition as true. Since the invention of the thermometer, most people have found this statement true. That is because most people have lived at or near sea level, historically. Those who live in the Alps, the Rocky Mountains or the Himalayas, and those scientists who have done research at such altitudes, realise that the statement needs to be modified before we can call it true. It should say, water boils at 100 degrees Celsius at sea level on this planet. Similarly, the second proposition, PQ equals QP, is only true or valid within ordinary algebra. It is not true in the equally valid, self-consistent algebra invented by William Rowan Hamilton. It is possible that truth only exists when one has already specified the context or field within which one is speaking. The third proposition, the communists are plotting to enslave us, may require even more pedantic analysis before we come to any conclusion about it. I leave it for the reader to ponder a while longer before I return to this subject. Perhaps what I am doing in this damned crazy book is demonstrating a new quasi-Newtonian law in psychology, a law whereby every mental action produces an equal and opposite mental reaction, so that every idol or obsession, if worshipped devoutly enough and humorlessly enough, gradually turns into its own opposite. In particular, we will see evidence that scepticism and blind faith often turn into each other if somebody is logical enough or mad enough to pursue them to that point of pure abstract consistency where ordinary common sense is left behind in the rush for certitude. It is obvious that every dogmatic faith produces around itself a secondary layer of doubt, denial and outright scepticism about rival faiths. The most bigoted Bible fundamentalist, for instance, is capable of quite corrosive cynicism about the miracles of Buddha. The most fanatic Marxist is also a cynic about the infallibility of the Pope. The Ayatollah Khomeini 
believes every word of the Quran, he says. But he is downright atheistic about the pronouncements of the US State Department. This is universal. Every faith, every acceptance creates a necessary doubt or rejection or things outside the faith. Every idol is jealous of other idols. Less obviously, the humorless or obsessive or crusading skeptic has his or her own blind faith, a psychological scotoma that is unconscious and therefore unacknowledged. To deny dogmatically is to say that something is impossible, but to assert this is to claim tacitly that you already know the full spectrum of the possible. In a century in which every decade has brought new and astonishing scientific shocks, that is a huge, brave and audacious faith indeed. It requires an almost heroic self-confidence and an equally gigantic ignorance of recent intellectual history. The only escape from this trap, as far as I can see, is to be sceptical about one's own scepticism, which is what I mean by the new agnosticism. Fall 1984, The Skeptical Inquirer, Journal of the Committee for the Scientific Investigation of Claims of the Paranormal, Volume 9, Number 1, page 44, article by Professor Mario Mungi. Likewise, telepathy may be a fact after all, though not clairvoyance, precognition or psychokinesis, all of which conflict with basic physical laws. Leaving aside Professor Mungay's odd tolerance about telepathy, heresy to get printed in that journal, note well what his sentence says and what it implies. It seems to me that it implies that he already knows all the laws of the universe, or all the important ones, and that is what I mean by a huge and audacious faith. To you and me, and the man and woman in the street, it is now obvious that nobody in the past ever knew all the laws, or all the important laws. The scientists of 1904 were astounded by the, the discoveries of 1910, those of 1914 by the discoveries of 1920, etc. From this, we have learned a certain mild agnosticism or open-mindedness. We are prepared to be startled by new discoveries. Professor Mungi is not so prepared. He knows in advance what is possible and what is not possible. Few theologians these days dare to speak with that kind of dogmatic authority. Professor Mungay's scepticism has become a blind faith, a faith that he knows in 1984 what may and may not be proved in 1990. Since this book is a venture in guerrilla ontology, an attempt to enlarge our concept of the thinkable in the tradition of Nietzsche, Surrealism, Pataphysics and Charles Fort, it will predictably be denounced violently by the Citadel and by those self-described sceptics like Professor Mungay who have turned, who have a blind faith in current idols, accepted paradigms and the local tribal reality tunnel in general. Because I have a vulgar taste for a little Baroque rhetoric now and then, I shall continue to call these high priests of the modern idol the New Inquisition and refer to their dogmatic reality tunnel as the New Fundamentalism. These are not intended solely as terms of abuse such as all the polemicists try to hang around the necks of their opponents. I wish to distinguish between liberals and fundamentalists in science as well as in religion and even in general philosophy. For instance, one who has had his mind enlarged or ruined by a good course in epistemology might come out a fundamentalist or absolutist, Humean, convinced that all proof is impossible and no idea is any more valid than any other. But a wiser and less logical student might become merely a liberal Humean, one who holds that no proof is absolute but some ideas are more plausible than others, e.g. If it rains, the street will get wet. Similarly, there are liberal theists everywhere these days who will cheerfully admit there is no undeniable argument for God's existence, but still think the case for God is a little better than the case against God. And of course, 
there are fundamentalist theists, survivors of the old Inquisition, who would happily burn at the stake anybody who has any doubts on the matter at all. The liberal materialist, then, I define as one who holds that materialism is a relative best bet among competing philosophies or the most plausible model around, whereas the fundamentalist materialist, either out of ignorance of philosophy or out of sheer bravado or out of blind faith, proclaims that materialism is the one true philosophy and that anyone with doubts or hesitations about it is insane, perverse or a deliberate fraud. This one true philosophy is the modern form of the one true church of the dark ages. The fundamentalist materialist is the modern idolater. He has made an image of the world and now he kneels and worships it. Fundamentalist science is similar to other fundamentalisms. Lacking humour, charity and some measure of self-doubt, it behaves intolerantly, fanatically and savagely to all heretics. Eventually, like all closed ideological systems, it becomes comical and overtly ridiculous, and that shall be my main demonstration. Because it provides a certain drama, or a certain low comedy, I shall write as if the new fundamentalists are firmly entrenched in power structures everywhere in the modern world, and rarely act like a new inquisition towards those who reject their idol. I confess again that this rhetoric is, like all polemics, exaggerated and wicked, really. The men of the Citadel have never burned books or conspired to suppress books or faked evidence to support their own prejudices or engaged in calculated smear campaigns against those who differ from them. They are honourable men, all honourable men, of course. Nonetheless, see The Quest for Wilhelm Reich by Colin Wilson, Granada Books, London. In October 1957, agents of the US government went to the Orgone Institute Press in New York City. They seized all the books. They loaded the books into a commandeered garbage truck. They drove to Van de Voort Street incinerator. They burned the books. This was not back in the dark ages. It was only a few years ago. It did not happen in a fascist or Marxist dictatorship, but in a nation whose constitution specifically forbids that pyromaniac way of disposing of unpopular ideas. And it was not instigated by religious fanatics, but by those scientific fanatics whom J.B. Priestley dubbed the Citadel. The books were by Dr. Wilhelm Reich, a former student of Freud and a political radical. Dr. Reich had been a communist briefly and a socialist for a while and eventually developed his own ideology called work democracy, which can be briefly described as more or less similar to the guild socialism of Chesterton, the anarchism of Kropotkin and the libertarian Marxism currently fashionable amongst rebels against orthodox Marxism. Dr. Reich also believed that all ideologies, including his own, were unworkable until a sexual revolution of psychological, not political, nature occurred and pol people were no longer ashamed of their bodily functions. Dr. Reich annoyed the American Medical Association by taking an extreme psychosomatic position, holding that almost all illness was caused by repression in both the Freudian and political senses i.e. that domesticated primates had been trained to a kind of masochistic submissiveness that literally made them sick, both physically and mentally. Reich also annoyed the powerful American Psychoanalytical Association by claiming that Freudian therapy did not cure anything in itself and needed to be supplemented by what is now called bodywork, various techniques to relax the muscles and normalised the breathing. Worst of all, he mortally offended the Citadel by insisting that all nuclear energy, even in peaceful industry, was unhealthy for humans, and to ensure his unpopularity, he directly challenged the new fundamentalism by alleging the existence of a new energy characteristic of living beings, which he called orgone. 
which was suspiciously like the vital force posited by anti-materialists such as Bergson and Bernard Shaw. The propaganda war against Reich had been led by Martin Gardner, a scientific fundamentalist whom we shall meet many times in these pages. Mr Gardner has an infallible method of recognising real science and of recognising pseudoscience. Real science is what agrees with his idol and pseudoscience is what challenges that idol. Colin Wilson has written, I wish I could be as sure of anything as Martin Gardner is of everything. Not all the popes of the 20th century collectively have dared to issue as many absolute dogmas as Mr Gardner. No man has had such superb faith in his own utter correctness since Oliver Cromwell. Mr Gardner's papal bulls against the Reichian heresy are very interesting and very typical of fundamentalism when enraged, in that one finds a strong, very strong implication that Dr Reich was insane and hallucinating, although this is never stated directly and unambiguously. It is even possible for a defender of Mr Gardner to claim that that sentence is unfair, because Gardner never explicitly said Reich was as crazy as a dancing mouse. He merely said, for example, that Reich's books sound like comic opera. Nonetheless, the suggestion of mental unbalance is heavily present in everything Gardner wrote about Dr. Reich. This suggestion is almost always implied in fundamentalist diatribes against those who do not accept their idol. One might say that they are not sure you must be crazy to disagree with them, but that they strongly suspect it. To the best of my knowledge, having followed the literature of the Reich controversy for nearly 30 years, there is no place in Gardner's writings where he claims that he repeated Dr. Reich's experiments and obtained results contrary to Reich's claims. As an agnostic, I suppose it is possible that Mr. Gardner did make this assertion somewhere, but if he did so, he must have so asserted in a very obscure periodical with a very low circulation, and the reports of his experiments have not been reprinted in any publication findable by me. It appears from available sources that Mr. Gardner did not conduct any experiments to test Dr. Reich's claims. It appears that the Mr. Gardner had, or thought he had, the same kind of knowledge as Professor Munge. He knew what was possible and what was impossible, so he did not have to investigate. While Mr. Gardner and several others denounced Dr. Reich in the media, members of the American Medical Association and American Psychoanalytic Association pressured the government to prosecute Reich as a crank or a charlatan. Dr. Reich, either out of delusions of grandeur or out of principled commitment to libertarian ideals, take your choice, refused to admit that the government had any right to pass judgment on scientific theories, and as a result was convicted only of contempt of court. Nonetheless, the government followed this with the book burning, and with the destruction by acts of equipment in Dr Reich's research laboratory, and then threw him in prison, where he died of a heart attack after a few months. Reich's co-worker, Dr Michael Silvert, subsequently committed suicide. It would be comforting to think Reich was a nut, a raving cuckoo, as Gardner implies. That is the sane, conservative attitude to take. It is a bit unnerving to think that books that get burned in democratic nations might have something valuable in them, like the books that get burned in undemocratic nations. Still, burning books is a bit thick. It leaves a bad smell to those of us raised on Burke and Jefferson and Mill. And Reich was not the only victim of the new Inquisition. There have been others. We will meet them as we go along. The new idol might be as blind and savage as the old. Oh, no. I admitted that was only melodramatic rhetoric. But... Just suppose Dr Reich was even partly or occasionally right. After all, even a stop clock is right twice a day. But the Citadel burned all of his books, all. 30 years of scientific research dumped into a flaming garbage incinerator. A burnt offering to the Moloch of orthodoxy. 
The books included The Impulsive Personality, The Function of the Orgasm, Character Analysis, The Mass Psychology of Fascism, The Sexual Revolution, People in Trouble, The Murder of Christ, The Cancer Biopathy, and others. 30 years of reports on psychotherapeutic practice, sociological observations of Nazi and Communist Party members and their work situations and family relations, laboratory research on bioelectrical charge and discharge in orgasm, clinical studies of the psychology of cancer and asthma patients, dozens of alleged experiments with the alleged orgone energy, all of it burned, consumed. I have no idea how much of that 30-some years of work was sound, how much unsound. I know that the Reich orgasm formula of four stages of physiological excitation and relaxation has been confirmed by Masters and Johnson, and that his analysis of the fascist personality has been widely accepted by other psychologists, and that many of the therapeutic techniques he pioneered are widely used in the United States, such as teaching the patient to scream and weep, and strike out with fists. I do not deduce from that that all of Reich's ideas were correct. I think it might take perhaps two decades of work by several independent scientific groups to sort out how much of the orgone theory is sound and how much is perhaps as loony as Gardner and the fundamentalist materialists claim. I see only one certitude in this whole tragedy of book burning an independent intellect caged in a prison. Thou shalt not blaspheme the new idol. I must emphasise that neither Mr Gardner nor any of the other fundamentalists who write diatribes against Dr Reich were responsible for the book burning, which was entirely the responsibility of the scientists and bureaucrats working for the US government itself, the muscle of the citadel, as it were. Nonetheless, the citadel as a whole looked on, unmoved. Only 18 psychiatrists in the whole country signed a protest against the book burning. Mr Gardner himself, in the revised edition of one of his books, Fads and Fallacies in the Name of Science, Dover, New York, 1957, expresses repugnance at the burning of Reich's works. Nonetheless, the new inquisition rolled along. None of Dr. Reich's books could legally be printed in the US until 1967. Those who would have liked to have formed an independent opinion of the scientific issues were legally unable to see or touch or even smell the verboten pages. And the inquisitorial spirit continues today. While many psychologists admit some soundness in some of Reich's ideas, he is not respectable to the citadel in general and biologists and physicists never mention his alleged orgone, except to sneer at it. This attitude survives despite the fact that nobody has yet published, in a major scientific journal, or any small journal known to me, experiments that refute or contradict Reich's claims. The Citadel feels no need to test Reich's ideas, it seems. The intuitive certainty of Gardner and Professor Munge appear to be widespread almost omnipresent in the citadel. Everybody there knows Dr. Reich was wrong, so nobody bothers to investigate the matter. There have been a few heretics, of course, but they have been ignored. In 1962 appeared A New Method of Weather Control by Charles Kelly, privately printed. Kelly had been working for the US Weather Bureau when Dr. Reich, just before his imprisonment, wrote to them that he would produce a rainstorm in Maine to demonstrate the existence of his officially non-existent orgone energy. The rainstorm happened. We have already explained that, of course, even a stop clock is right twice a day. Besides, it was only coincidence. Remember that phrase. It is the self-hypnotic chant by which the new inquisition banishes all evidence it does not like. We will hear it often. But Kelly was intrigued by the man who made a storm with non-existent energy. He repeated Dr. Reich's weather control experiments. His book has photos of his alleged results. The photos conclusively prove that Dr. Reich's experiments work. 
or else that Kelly is good at faking photos, as all photos that challenge the dogmas of the new Inquisition are, by definition, fakes, of course. Still, the impulse to sin and heresy is in all of us, well, except for such stalwarts of faith as Gardner and Munger. And some will dare to wonder, suppose Kelly did not fake those photos. That's the way the powers of darkness seduce us. The path to hell is easy. You think a thought like that, and the next thing, you're wondering about UFOs, or ESP even, God help you, astrology. You might even end up meditating and eating vegetables. The right controversy is not dead, even though the, the books were burned and the man was buried. Every few years, a new book comes out by somebody, some spawn of the devil, who claims that, like Kelly, he repeated Dr. Reich's experiments and got positive results. In Orgone, Reich and Eros, sociologist Eric Mann describes his experiments with an Orgone blanket that worked, or seemed to. In Love and Orgasm, Alexandra Lowen, MD, cautiously uses the vague expression bioenergy instead of the verboten Orgone, but says his work with patience confirms Reich's claims. In Orgone and Me, actor Orson Bean says he could see the damned Orgone after being treated by an organomic physician, Dr. Baker. In The Cosmic Pulse of Life, retired naval officer Trevor Constable has photos that either confirm Reich or show that Constable, like Kelly, knows how to fake photos. They're all hallucinating, of course, except the ones with photos who are frauds. Of course. Of course. Knowing that, by definition, we don't have to go to the trouble of checking their claims. Still, a few may have growing doubts at this point. I don't know. I'm not particularly interested here in how much of Reich was right or wrong. I present the Reich case as one illustration of how the current idol, the orthodoxy of biological materialism, maintains itself. It does so all the way all orthodoxies and idols have always maintained themselves. We will see more of this when we come to the case of Dr. Sheldrake, the English biologist who rediscovered the damned orgone, or something a lot like it, and called it the morphogenetic field. Going back a bit, if water boils at 100 degrees Celsius is only true at sea level on this planet, and perhaps at a few similar places in space-time, but not everywhere in space-time, and if PQ equals QP is only true or valid within one kind of algebra, then perhaps truth is only relative to a context of some sort. Well, maybe. I don't expect everybody to jump to that conclusion at once. We are trying to move from a kind of first plateau scepticism to a kind of second plateau scepticism. We aren't going to leap blindly to nth plateau scepticism quite yet. However, we might remember the opinion of Sir Karl Popper, who holds that we can never establish absolute truth since that would require an infinite number of tests. Popper also argues that absolute falsity can be established, since a statement in absolute form is falsified once a single exception to it is found. If we accept this view, which seems historically plausible, then the Aristotelian true-false game becomes relative to our knowledge at a particular time in history and should be modified at least to relatively true and absolutely false. For instance, unless we are excessively pedantic, Ronald Reagan wrote Hamlet should be considered absolutely false. If we want to be excessively pedantic, we can rewrite this proposition as Ronald Reagan wrote the version of Hamlet attributed to Shakespeare. And then it is absolutely false since we know of at least one, and in fact many, copies of Shakespeare's Hamlet that were in print before Mr. Reagan was born. We thus avoid the tricky possibility that Mr. Reagan wrote his own version of Hamlet in youth and then went stark staring sane and destroyed it as I destroyed my own poetic effusions of youth. How about our proposition three? The infamous Dr. Crippen poisoned his wife. We stipulate that the infamous Dr. Crippen is the Dr. Crippen that most readers are thinking of, 
the first man arrested by wireless telegraphy, that Dr. Crippen. This proposition, like the ones about the boiling of water and PQ being equal to QP, appears at least relatively true to most of us. It is interesting, however, that we seem to have already passed through three kinds of relative truth. Water boils at 100 degrees Celsius is true relative to the laws of physics at sea level on this planet. PQ equals QP is valid relative to one kind of algebra. The infamous Dr. Crippen poisoned his wife is true relative to the rules of evidence in our legal system. Traditionally, we express this by saying, Dr. Crippen was proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. This kind of proof, however, is not the experimental proof of physics, nor the formal proof of mathematics. It is legal proof. At the risk of seeming even more pedantic and annoying than usual, I suggest that since scientific proof, mathematical proof and legal proof all have different rules, they refer to three kinds of truth or three kinds of demonstration. The infamous Dr. Crippen was convicted of poisoning his wife seems to be a fourth kind of statement, namely a historical truth, and is or seems to all but the nth plateau sceptic more certain than the legal truth that the blighter did poison his wife. The historical truth is based on the assumption that we possess accurate records. But the statement that Crippen was guilty is based on the additional assumption that the jury did not make a mistake in that case. And what about Proposition 4? The Communists are plotting to enslave us. That does not appear to be a scientific truth, or mathematical truth, or even a legal truth. What sort of truth is that? That's a tough one. We had better postpone it again while we continue our eccentric ramble from first plateau scepticism to second plateau scepticism. The Citadel has had a vigorous and versatile propaganda department in the United States called the Committee for Scientific Investigation of Claims of the Paranormal, or CSICOP for short. You will not be surprised to learn that Martin Gardner and Professor Munger are among its spokesmen. CSICOP's method of scientific investigation, generally, is to wage a campaign of vilification in the media against any researcher whose ideas they don't like. What did I just say? That was polemical and unfair. I apologise. They are all honourable men. Fate Magazine, United States, October 1981. 32-page article entitled, Star Baby by Dennis Rawlins, a Harvard physics graduate who knows CSICOP from the inside. He was a co-founder in 1976, served on its executive council from 1976 to 1979, and was associate editor of their journal, originally the Zetetic, now the Skeptical Inquirer, from 1976 to 1980. Oh. I am fearful of writing this. This is a terrible blasphemy, even after such damn things as Orgone. But Rawlings discovered in early 1977 that the first scientific study performed by CSICOP was, to put it mildly, erroneous. He calls the statistical methods used bungling. Professor Elizabeth Scott of the Statistics Department of the University of California called it misleading. Whatever one wants to call it, it was, as we shall see, a remarkable bit of unfeasible logic. This was the case. The French statistician Michael Gorquellin had published a large-scale statistical sampling which seemingly confirmed some of the predictions of astrology. CSICOP had decided to refute this. Rawlings claimed there was no doubt in anyone's mind in CSICOP that they intended to refute, not to examine impartially, and centred on one particular area, which has come to be known as the Mars effect. Mars, relative to Earth, can be classified as occupying 12 positions in the sky at various times. Two of those positions can be regarded as favourable for the births of sports champions. If there is no validity in astrology, the chance of champions actually being born in those two positions, Mars rising or Mars transiting, are 
2 over 12, or approximately 17%. Gorquillen's statistics showed that the percentage of European sports champions born in those two time zones was actually 22%. Now this deviation of more than 5% may not seem overwhelming to a layperson, but to a statistician it is meaningful. The odds against it occurring by chance are several million to one. Thus, if Gorquillen's statistics are valid, either astrology is partially confirmed or some other explanation of the deviation is needed. The CSICOP report claims to have identified the factor that explained the deviation. This is known as the Mars Dawn effect, and means simply that when Mars is rising relative to a position on Earth, it is around dawn at that place. The CSICOP report claimed to prove that the 22% of sports champions born then was not significant because 22% of all humans are born then, evidently because, for biological reasons, Pregnant women are slightly more likely to go into final labour around dawn than at other hours. The report did not prove this, it obtained this result by juggling figures, especially by reducing the total number of sports champions from 2088 to 303. This is what Rawlins calls bungling and Professor Scott termed misleading. If CSICOP caught a parapsychologist or astrologer doing something similar, they would call it fraud or cooking the data. In any event, when the figures are corrected and the full 2,088 sports champions are considered, instead of the partial sample of 303, the statistics actually confirm Gorkelin instead of refuting him. The actual figures then are 17% of all humans are born in the time zone of the Mars effect, as chance predicts and 22% of sports champions are born then, as Gorklin had claimed. As I say, Rawlins calls this bungling. Some will have a stronger name for it. About what followed there seems to be no possibility of using bungling or general incompetence as an explanation. Rawlins, and Professor Scott, you will remember, discovered the statistical fallacy in the report before the end of 1977. All through 1978, Rawlins, a member of CSICOP Executive Council, attempted to get this error corrected. He ran into a stone wall, and calls the behaviour of other CSICOP executives a cover-up and compares it to the Watergate affair in politics. The committee refused to publish a letter by Rawlins about the matter, even though he was associate editor of their journal. When Rawlins did a follow-up study, which amusingly enough did contradict Gorkelin, CSICOP was glad to publish it, but refused to allow him to include it in a section describing the error in their original report. When Rawlins insisted that they print a sentence saying that part of his article had been censored, the other editors agreed verbally and then removed the sentence without telling him. That is, they not only censored him, but censored his attempt to tell readers they were censoring him. When Rawlings insisted on a team of referees to judge the dispute, the executives did not allow an impartial team to be chosen, but selected their own referees. Nonetheless, the referees agreed that, when the errors were corrected, the original report did in fact confirm Gorkelin instead of refuting him, as Rawlings and Professor Scott had said from the beginning. The committee then refused to print the referee's report. By 1979, Rawlins felt that he had seen so much dishonesty in the matter that he should speak out, but hesitated because I didn't want to hurt rationalism. He went on struggling to get his corrections published and finally realised that real politic cynics were taking advantage of that reluctance and exploiting his loyalty to the cause. He tried to speak out at a press conference and the Executive Council stopped the press conference before he could speak. The Executive Council then met in closed session with all members but Rawlins and voted him out of the Executive. They allowed him to continue as Associate Editor of their journal, however, and he went on struggling to get the correction published for another year. In 1980, he resigned from CSICOP in total disillusionment. To summarise, CSICOP published a scientifically false report. They blocked all attempts by a member of their own executive council to inform members that the report was false. 
When their own selected referees agreed that the report was false, they suppressed the referee's report. This went on over a period of four years. And if bungling explains the beginning of it, Rawlings' term cover-up certainly does not seem too strong for what followed. Perhaps my wicked polemical phrase, the new fundamentalism, is not too strong after all. Fate, September and October 1979. The Crusade Against the Paranormal by Jerome Clark and J. Gordon Melton. Another founding member of CSICOP resigned or was ejected. Accounts differ, but Professor Marcello Truzzi, sociologist from Eastern Michigan University, was editor of the CSICOP journal when it was called the Zetetic. He had a difference of opinion with the Executive Council about whether dissenting views should be published. He says, CSICOP isn't skeptical at all in the true meaning of that word, but is an advocacy body upholding orthodox establishment views. In other words, their alleged skepticism has become, as my paradox suggests, just another dogmatic blind faith. Professor Trizzi has started his own journal, now called The Zetetic Scholar, in competition with CSICOP's journal, now called The Skeptical Inquirer. He follows the normal procedure of what is usually considered adult debate among sane people. He prints articles on both sides of every question and allows open debate. Unlike The Skeptical Inquirer, which only prints articles on one side since they already, already know the truth. Their fury against him is what any student of priestcraft would expect. <laughs>